Welcome uh, and thanks for taking uh, all the time this afternoon to, to spend with us talking about manure treatment technologies and what some of the options are for livestock farms. As Rick said, I, I'm in biosystems engineering at Michigan State. Uh, my primary responsibility is to manage our research center focused on anaerobic digestion uh, technologies, which you know, ranges from the feedstocks we put into anaerobic digestion to uh, utilizing the, the residual post digestion. Um, separating manure products and, and creating value there. Um, so I'm going to spend the next uh, 25 minutes or so just giving a, a brief overview of manure treatment technologies. Um, it's a very big topic if we focused just on dairy, but focusing across the, all livestock sectors uh, makes it a really overwhelming uh, topic to cover. But the goal here is to give you just an a introduction to the terms and technologies that are used and how they're used and um, hopefully sets, uh, set the stage for finding additional information. So, so as I see it and as we work in the field of nutrient recovery, um, so I'm jumping already from manure treatment to nutrient recovery because that's really the end focus um, for the work that we do here and, and the work that uh, we do in collaboration with nutrient is looking at how do we create products from manure and how do we essentially decompose manure into its various solids and nutrients. And so you see a list ranging from coarse solid with separation to fines at the membrane. There's energy generation, there's drying and bedding recovery, and then there's a whole litany of other technologies. Um, and we'll just touch on a few near the end of the presentation that, that provide you know, livestock producers, dairy farms, poultry, different ways to, you know, manage manure uh, and over the long term hopefully create value in that manure or, or more value. When we start to think about how do we select and identify technologies that are appropriate at the farm level, there are a tremendous number of things to consider, um, but the first and, and foremost one is what are the manure characteristics? And so as we look at different technologies, we can we can box them in a little bit just based on the, the, the moisture content. So are we dealing with a a liquid, are we dealing with a, a slurry, a semi-solid, or a solid? Um, is that moisture content less than 50%, which may make it more suitable for thermal conversion than some of the mechanical or biological processes? So manure characteristics are very important, but also understanding, you know, at the farm level, is bedding used? How is the manure handled uh, prior to treatment? Are, you know, is there moisture added during collection? Is there moisture added during conveyance? Uh, does drying take place? or other uh, things that are being added, you know, prior to that going into some sort of treatment system. But then it's also, what is the goals? You know, what are the target products? What are the, the target needs that the farm's looking at trying to uh, deal with? And, and why are they considering manure treatment technologies, nutrient recovery technologies? Are they trying to reduce the cost of hauling uh, manure to distant fields? And so they're just trying to concentrate nutrients and some phosphorus is the goal to get more to a, you know, a circular farm where they're capturing and reusing, you know, water for, for, for drinking or other repurposed or other, other on-farm uses. And so, you know, understanding the characteristics and how things are happening on the farm, but also what those target products are, will will start to, I guess, create a little bit clearer field of vision for what treatment technologies might make most sense. You know, and it's, it's, again, where does the treatment happen here? We know that Manure is excreted from livestock. Livestock, livestock is typically in that 10 to 12 percent uh, total solids range. So, you know, 80 to or 88 to 90 percent water, with the exception of poultry that's that's a little drier. But as we handle it, and as we manage it on the farm, those characteristics change greatly. You know, whether it's a beef feedlot where the total solids, uh, as it's collected, is typically just shy of 50 percent. Uh, poultry, you know, there's a big range uh, depending on if it's turkey or broiler. Layers also would be in there, but you can see how the characteristics change there. Dairy, again, are you a freestall barn that's a daily scrape or a flush where you're going to be in, a, in the flush case one to three percent total solids, or are you a dry lot dairy uh, in the southwest where over the course of, of 12 hours between collections, um, manure, moisture content, you can lose seven percent. And so um, understanding how the characteristics of that manure that you actually want to process, how those change, and what those look like, 
is really important to identifying, you know, and again, starting to select treatment technology. So again, we're transitioning from winter treatment to, in my case, we always want to target why are we doing this? And so I uh, tend to, to put those in as nutrient recovery in addition. So, you know, examples of some technologies that we'll talk about solid liquid separation, anaerobic digestion, uh, dissolved air flotation is a, is a specific type of fine solids recovery. And the reason we do this hopefully is, you know, one of many, and this is a, a slide that was created uh, for the dairy industry, but it, it just highlights that we have the opportunity to recover energy. We have um, nitrogen, we have phosphorus, we have fiber. So just the, the residual carbon in manures has, has value or has the potential to have value. There's, there's greenhouse gas emissions, um, potentially credits for those. There's also, you know, less easily quantified, you know, monetarily quantifiable things like odor control, is, which would correlate with, with uh, greenhouse gas reductions. So are we doing this for odor control? Are we doing this um, for, for hauling purposes, I, as I talked about earlier, that maybe it's just easier to haul concentrated phosphorus and fiber than it is to, to haul, you know, a slurry of 5% solids. Um, again, kind of just, you know, and I know poultry has done this and swine have taken looks at their carbon footprint and some of these economic values, but when we talk about carbon in particular, we know that half of that contribution to a carbon footprint of a gallon of milk comes from uh, farm and milk production. And, and a large portion of that is actually related to how we store and handle manure on the farm. And so we can have a huge impact on uh, the carbon footprint of a gallon of milk or a pound of bacon, um, just by looking at how we manage manure uh, at the farm level. So nutrient recovery, um, you know, in engineering speak, it's a, you know, there's a lot of different black boxes that we can plug in. Um, typically, at least from my standpoint, I look at it as four, uh, a sequential process of four steps. And so we wanna start with coarse solid liquid separation, of course, where we're gonna take out coarse fiber. Um, once we get the, the coarse fiber out, we can move on and focus on fine solids. Um, those particles less than 250 microns. And typically as we remove those, we're also going to remove a significant quantity of the phosphorus contained in the manure, as well as organic nitrogen. Um, when we get the, the, the fine solids out and we start to get to a, um, a very dilute stream um, with very you know, small residual solids, we can then target New, uh, nitrogen recovery. And again, then salt recovery or clean water would be the last step. Um, if we really wanted to go to kind of the, the final level, um, we would actually probably treat that water stream coming off with some sort of disinfection. But for today, we're going to stop just at uh, salt recovery. So for the next few minutes, I'm just going to walk through each of these boxes and talk about kind of what some of the pros and cons and why we do those. Uh, give some examples of some of the you know, probably more mainstream technologies that fit into those boxes and, and what some of the general order of magnitude costs are and efficiencies are. So uh, we'll start with coarse solid, solid, coarse solid liquid separation. Uh, it's very common on farms around the country, particularly on dairy farms. Uh, we use this technology again to, re, you know, essentially remove that large undigested fiber in the diet. And so we're doing it to, re, to reduce, you know, pipe clogging issues. We're we're trying to reduce sludge accumulation in our storages to stop crusting potentially, to make land application easier. The, the material we pull off is, is, is used as bedding material in many cases on dairies. Uh, it's a good soil amendment, of course, because it, it has that organic piece to it. Uh, and there is some nitrogen and phosphorus in the fiber. Uh, and it's a good, it's a good input, input for compost as well. So it's a nice bulking agent, a nice carbon source for uh, for compost. And so we see solid liquid se separation here. We see uh, uh, the, the screw presses. Uh, on the bottom is the uh, rotating drum thickener. And on the right is a, a weeping cell, which is, is, you know, a very effective passive way of separating fiber. Um, not very common in the north, but, but certain parts of the country, weeping cells are, are a good technology for separating fiber. So I'm not going to spend time on this because you're going to have the slides and you have opportunity to read these. Uh, some nice, just high level statements about how these different core separation uh, technologies work and what they do. Uh, this was put together by Nutrient and I've, I've got several slides in here where it just gives you, you know, one or two sentence overview of what this 
uh, what these individual pieces of equipment are. But again, we have multiple options to go into this block of course all the separation. And this, these are probably three and we could put others in there as well. When we look at the technology as it's applied, um, this cost data was taken from dairy uh, and from some, some studies that were done on dairy farms around the United States. I've taken it and, and put it into terms of per thousand gallon. So, so it's published in, in a per cow basis, um, but I've just modified it so we can look at it just on a flow basis. So we can talk about it across all, all species. It's in my intention, it's meant to give you an overview of, you know, you know, an order of magnitude, how efficient are these at removing nutrients and then how costly are these technologies to deploy on a farm? And so when we look at just solid liquid separation or coarse solid liquid separation, you know, it's going to take, you know, roughly 15 to 30% of the, the phosphorus and nitrogen out of manure. It's going to cost us on the order of about, you know, 70 to 80 cents per gallon, per thousand gallons of, of manure going through this to maintain it, to operate it, to, to replace consumables. And our capital costs, you know, and this is probably the, Mark and I had a little discussion about this just prior to the call. This is the one where this is our capital investment. So this is one-time money, and this is what it's gonna cost us to uh, install this equipment on a, on a per thousand gallon basis for all of the manure that we would process in a year. So if it's a million gallons, we would divide that million by a thousand and then multiply it by the 4.4 or five to get you know, a ballpark on our capital costs. So, we see that these technologies are really relatively inexpensive on a, on a per thousand gallons or per gallon basis. And, and that's why we're, we, we see them, you know, utilized pretty heavily around the country uh, on a lot of different livestock types, but again, primarily dairy. Once we get that fine, and these technologies are aimed at taking out, the coarse solid liquid separation, coarse solid liquid separation is aimed at taking out particle sizes of 500 to 750 microns and larger. And so it's, it's really the coarse, you know, the large particles in the manure stream. Once we get uh, the coarse fiber out, if there is a need to do additional treatment, uh, the next logical step and the next, you know, physically possible step is really to begin to remove fine solids from the manure stream. And as I said, when we remove, remove that five car fine carbon stream, uh, we're also gonna pull out a large portion of the, the phosphorus or a larger portion of the phosphorus and uh, organic nitrogen as well. And so why do we do this? In, in many cases, uh, maybe the farm is phosphorus limited, and so they've just got a limited land base or the land base is, is high in phosphorus and there's a need to export. And so we just need to get phosphorus out of the manure uh, to export that. In some cases, we wanna, we wanna uh, spray irrigate, you know, liquid near the farm to reduce truck traffic, to reduce cost, and we wanna just be able to truck concentrate farther distances. Um, a good opportunity there. And then, and then maybe there's a potential to move and, and market the nutrients. So maybe, you know, someone's in a situation where they can actually, you know, they have an outlet to sell fine solids and phosphorus. Uh, again, it's a great soil amendment and fertilizers we know, and it's, it's also a very good input to, to compost to improve or increase the, the nutrient content of so here again, we see some overlap in technologies, but we see other technologies, you know, also introduced. And so there's actually two slides. Um, you know, as you dive deeper into the, the nuance of fine solid separation, there are physical mechanical ways to do that using um, moving disc press, using plate presses, um, using centrifuges. You can do things uh, chemically where you're adding polymers, coagulants, flocculants to precipitate or bring the phosphorus out of suspension, put it into a solid form, and then use a technology like a belt press um, or a band press to dewater that or an incline press, dissolved air flotation. Also typically would use a polymer, um, vibrating screen, centrifuges fit into this case. And then you've got some chemicals where, or the, the chemical transformation where you actually turn dissolved phosphorus into struvite um, or struvite crystal uh, using a, a struvite reactor and adding uh, ammonia and magnesium in the, in the proper ratios. And so again, not necessarily all encompassing, but we're trying to capture as many of the different technologies that would fit into this box as possible. And again, you can see livestock producers around the country have a lot of different options that are commercially available today. Uh, sorry. So here's a couple of examples, again, kind of taking the dairy because that's uh, more, more my background, but you can see 
where we go from an input manure concentration to a belt press of just under 700 milligrams per liter uh, of FOS. And coming off of that, you know, we're at two, uh, which is really low. I mean, I would say we're probably going to be typically less than 50. So uh, you see similar numbers that 39 milligrams per liter treating manure using ultra, ultra filtration. So you're going to go, you know, you can get easily 90 plus percent of the phosphorus concentrated um, using a chemical process and a belt press or, or a different technology or using that physical mechanical uh, ultra filtration process where you're really forcing the manure to go through a, a filtration process and concentrate, you know, the, the, the fine residual fine solids um, and just allow very fine molecules to pass through that. Uh, I've got a slide later that will kind of get into what those different sizes are. The products that you're going to get off of fine solids, uh, this is, is just two examples where you have solid materials. Um, you know, you can get fibrous materials just like we do off solid with separators that are, are bulky. You can get really dense, compressed, cakey materials uh, like the, the picture with the hand is showing. You can get concentrated slurry materials. Um, and then, of course, you always have that liquid stream that's going to be, you know, a thinner material, lighter colored material that also has to be managed. And so this is really the concentrated solids in a dry form. Again, that can also be a slurry, and then you can have liquids as well. Looking at this, again, you can see that our, our nutrient recovery does go up another uh, level where we're, we're moving into uh, as high as 90 plus percent phosphorus removals uh, and, and potentially 50% nitrogen removal range, depending on the technology. But our costs also, uh, you know, double on the capital side or more compared to just a coarse solid separation and, and really a jump of uh, an order of magnitude on the operating cost. So we go from something less than a dollar to, you know, three to, to $15 in operating cost per thousand gallons. Following on, again, nitrogen recovery is our next stage. Again, you know, we're looking at restrictions, uh, land application restrictions, um, a, the desire to irrigate water and, and put on higher levels. So maybe going to one or two inches of, of irrigated water per acre. Um, so by pulling that nitrogen out you've, in phosphorus, you really remove those restrictions on agronomic rates because we're gonna be at levels that are so low that we're still gonna have to supplement fertilizer on that irrigated land. Um, again, the opportunity to market is always good. Technologies here um, are air stripping, um, and they kind of, there's two diversions, they're two different, you know, and then biological. And so biological involves sequencing uh, anaerobic and, and aerobic conditions, whereas air stripping involves, you know, high temperatures, high pH, um, and then ammonia concentrating. And so we can create nitrogen gas or a concentrated nitrogen fertilizer off of this technology in a, in a water that or a liquid that is very low in nutrient content. Uh, again, a little bit more, the, the nitrogen, nitrification, denitrification process is the biological, and then the ammonia stripping uh, talks a little bit more about that. And, and it, you know, there's a tremendous amount of research that has been done on a lot of these different technologies. And so just providing you the, the terminology, I hope would, would open doors to find a lot more uh, information. So here, you know, we've already removed phosphorus, so we're actually not doing phosphorus removal in this process, but we know going into this, that our manure has to be very low in fine solids and phosphorus, and so that piece is already out. But our nitrogen levels or our nitrogen removal goes from that 50% removal uh, to upwards of 85. Again, operating costs are starting to climb. We're now in that 14 to probably $30 range or 15 to $30 range, and our capital cost has now started to also climb very quickly. So um, we do see as we, as we stack technologies, of course, the systems are going to get more expensive and more complex. Uh, the last step in the process or in the general process is that uh, concentration of salts and in, in production of clean water. Um, this is going to require uh, reverse osmosis, so the last of the membrane technologies. And so in the phosphor stage or in the fine solids, uh, I talked a little bit about uh, ultrafiltration. So that would be the, the second technology there, the UF. And so you can see with ultrafiltration, we're able to remove viruses, bacteria, and suspended solids. But our, our, our ions or our ionic forms of, of material are passing. When we get to RO, uh, we're really capturing everything that's in, that's in that, uh, you know, anything that's a contaminant in that water stream. And so the reverse, os tech, reverse osmosis technology is what's used to produce clean, drinkable water. Uh, and that is really the, the, 
what the technology is used for in a manure system as well, in a, a nutrient recovery system. So more complicated technology requires a little bit more discussion and introduction, um, kind of what the background is on that. Here we really jump in our performance, you know, is probably very close to 100% removal of nitrogen and phosphorus from the manure stream. Our operating costs and our capital costs really do, do climb. And this is, uh, to go to this level of manure treatment, you have to have a very strong case um, or a very strong business need to really produce clean water. That's, that's the end goal here. The concentrate uh, can be used as a fertilizer product, but the real, the real target goal here is clean water. Energy generation um, falls into a couple different categories that we have so the thermal conversion technologies. And so these are technologies that are going to be aimed at very dry products or very dry biomass. So typically used for woody biomass, um, poultry litter and turkey litter fit into this category very nicely. And we actually have a gas, we have a gasification system on a, a turkey farm here in Michigan um, that's been operating for a number of years. There's a few others around the country, but you're really talking moisture contents less than 30% to fit material into these technologies into the thermal conversion category. Uh, anaerobic digestion, I just have some pictures of different types. Um, probably lots of webinars have been done in the past on, on anaerobic digestion, lots of information out there, but it's a very good biological process to create natural gas from dairy manure. Um, as we look at some of those additional technologies, if we have needs for bedding on the farm or if we're trying to create marketable products that we could bag or sell wholesale, drum dryers um, become more important. So there's drum dryers, there's belt dryers. Uh, composting drums would give a very quick uh, pathogen reduction um, to manure that's gonna be used for, for a fertilizer or a, a landscaping purpose or even a, a bedding purpose. So again, a, you know, a couple of technologies in this category. Um, I'm sure there's, there's a few others that we're missing, but these would be the, the predominant technologies that are used for fiber drying or better recovery. Other, other things that have been thrown about, and again, this is just two. Um, Mark could probably talk more about this, but this category we could probably say has 50 or 60 different concepts in it. But worm composting with the, the verma composting or the verma filtration uh, is one technology. We use it here on campus to treat uh, food waste as a student organic farm. And, create a really good high value compost and, and fertilizer product. Um, evaporation, again, another way to reduce the, the, the challenges with handling water uh, mixed with manure or just water on farms in general. Uh, and so there is a little interest in evaporation of, of manure or of the liquid in manure. So product, I'm gonna get ready to transition mark in here, but you know, again, our goal is to you know, improve the sustainability of how we apply and how we use manure on, on crops. Um, and, and find you know more value in, in that manure. And so we're going to go from you know irrigating brown water that's noticeable to irrigating a low odor, low nutrient, or at least a, a more specific nutrient in the form of nitrogen um, that's less noticeable and, and has a we can put it on growing crops. And so hopefully we can get more more benefit out of it and, and create less of a, a footprint uh, for the neighbors. You know, manure solids as bedding is a is a big utilization or use of, of fiber on dairy farms around the country. Uh, composting is, is ever popular uh, all over. There's been work done by some of the, the faculty here at Michigan State and elsewhere, as well as the extension on creating construction, construction materials out of manure. Uh, there's a, a group up in the New England area that creates uh, biodegradable planting pots. And so um, Again, you know, if we go to the, the length of reverse osmosis and farms are doing this, we're creating potentially drinking water that we can use uh, to supply the cows uh, at the farm and, and cut down on our fresh water withdrawals. The Europeans, um, out of necessity, particularly Netherlands, have really looked to create international markets for um, manure fertilizer concentrates. And so they're bagging it, they're super sacking it, they're putting it in containers. Uh, and shipping it all over the, the world to access, you know, markets in developing regions of the world what, where phosphorus or where nutrients are limited and fertilizer is typically expensive. Uh, they need inexpensive forms of nutrients and they need carbon in their soils. And so um, partially out of necessity, but also opportunity, they're, they're finding ways with companies like Fertical in the Netherlands to, to move manure globally. Uh, and fill some needs, but also address the, the challenges with, with manure management, nutrient management in the home country. 
So where do we stand today? And I'll, I'll finish here and transition over to Mark. Uh, manure application costs are still inexpensive. And so if it's, you know, if it's available and, you, and it can be done properly, it is still the least cost uh, manure management, nutrient utilization opportunity you know, for our livestock farmers around the country. But social pressures are high. Um, we've seen cases in the Midwest here. We've seen challenges with water quality. Uh, there's been challenges in the Northeast and in, in Southeast, or I'm sorry, Northwest and Southwest as well. But we know socially, regulatory, there is a lot of, of eyes on how we manage manure. And it is something that as an industry, uh, we need to think about and be prepared to address. A lot of nutrient recovery technologies are out there. A lot are commercially available and have been demonstrated at scale on farms. Um, but you need to really dig in and, and do your homework to evaluate how those technologies are performing. You gotta consider that there are uh, farm specific situations. Capital and operation costs, you know, on some of these technologies can be extremely high. Um, that has to be planned for in advance. Uh, you have to do a lot of due diligence, especially on the operating costs of a lot of these. And then you do have to, if you do install nutrient recovery, you do have to consider the nutrients don't go away. We're putting them in different buckets or in different forms. They still are gonna require management. They're still, they still need to be utilized agronomically or in ways that are sustainable um, and to the best of their ability. The other part of this that we have to think about is, you know, as we, as we decompose manure into all these different products, we get different forms and we get thicknesses and we get slurries and solids and liquids. Uh, we got to plan for how we're going to store those. And, you know, the farther we get into turning or converting manure, you know, from its traditional forms that we think of as slurries um, into water, we may also have to look at how we design manure storages because our manure storages are designed with the idea that we're gonna store whole manure or maybe a slightly diluted form of manure. Um, and we have permeabilities on those liners. You know, as we get closer to being a water product, uh, we may have to have different design standards that apply to those so that we can you know, protect surface and groundwater, but also just contain that material. Uh, and so we do have to consider how we're gonna store nutrients because we're gonna go through a pretty good, you know, a high cost to break it down. So we don't necessarily want to just put it all back in the same storage, even you know, after we've gone to the effort of separating things into different piles. Um, you know, and there are a lot of resources and opportunities that, that do exist. And this is a good transition because Mark, I think, is going to talk about some of those resources and some of the work that Nutrient has done looking at opportunities. So contact information and I will figure out how to unshare my screen.